good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fine Sabbath. Are we good together? Get together with God's children. This morning, I want to uh, talk about fasting. But looking back, the last time that was uh, spoke on was uh, about five years ago. This was from an outline that Delvin had I ran across the other day, and he had extracted it from the book, and the book extracted extracted it from the Bible. So. It all comes from God, God's word, so. Uh, but, you know, fasting. So what is fasting? It's a spiritual exercise as well as it can be done for health or for healing. It's not a foundation stone or institution of the faith uh, like salvation or grace or baptism or marriage, something on that order. And it's not a, a cure-all for every spiritual ill. We know that there are different ones that fasted and they, David did to save his son's life, which to no avail, but yet it was an earnest effort. Uh, we know Paul it didn't heal everyone. Uh, it's also probably not a major biblical doctrine but uh, nevertheless, it is something that I think that is worthy of study. And it's, it's uh, how would you say, it's something that we can use uh, as long as we have the pure heart and our motivation is right. Uh, fasting provides a, a key to, to unlock doors uh, where, where perhaps other things fail. Uh, it's, uh, I guess you can say, a spiritual weapon to use, uh, and it uh, provides uh, mighty might to pull down strongholds if it's done with the right motives. If it's if if God uh, sees our heart and understands that it's it's pure, like David talked about it in our lessons this morning. Fast simply means not to eat. We, there's a period of time of every day that we don't eat for about 12 hours. That's why we call it break fast. You're breaking the fast of, of through the evening. So why do we fast? Uh, the New Testament church was known for its fasting. It was, uh, uh, they, they use it constant, consistently. Uh, as the, and, but you know, as time went on, as uh, the spirituality of church goers waned, or maybe the masses adopted worldly ways. Perhaps there was the, the church of particular is the, is the church in the wilderness, but uh, the church as a whole, it, fasting did wane. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the power of the, the, the the gifts of healing and a lot of the, the spiritual gifts were, were not exercised like they were in, in the New Testament church, the early church. And, but you know, today a lot of people think of someone who fasts for extended period of time as somebody that's extreme or fanatical. Uh, you know, to some fasting or starving is, are synonymous with, uh, with someone who, you know, it, does things that are not healthy for oneself. But, and you know, Ephesians does say in 529, it says, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. So it's natural to nourish our bodies. It's, it's natural to do, do those things, but uh, sometimes we put too much emphasis on, on worldly things and uh, Sometimes we use fasting uh, to communicate with God. Now, fasting did become uh, uh, a dominant feature in, in Middle Ages, uh, the post-apostolic post ages. There was a, a, an asceticism 
that uh, actually became quite extreme, as well as uh, pretty wild, wild, widespread in the in the Middle Ages. And asceticism just means practicing strict self-denial uh, as a measure of personal discipline. Uh, but you know, fasting had become in those times had become kind of like Jesus looked on the Pharisees that stood on the corner. It was, it was uh, you know, people revered the monk that had taken the vow of poverty and had, had uh, uh, you know, in self-denial, fasted continue in that. So it, it, uh, it, it was misused. It was misused that, uh, you know, you probably remember uh, Saul that had his, all his troops in the field of battle to not eat. Now, what, that wasn't an expedient thing to do. They needed the energy. And it turned out it was Jonathan who broke that, that rule that Saul set up. Yeah, uh, but uh, so fasting isn't always the right thing to do at the right moment. Uh, and then I, I think that uh, a lot of this attitude towards uh, towards fasting swung the other way, where where people uh, you know and I, you know kind of looked down on it as being uh, being uh, a little bit out of the ordinary. And uh, but you know, for those who hunger for God's best. Those who, uh, you know, they, they want to reach God in some way or another. And, and it, it, there is a, a valid use for fasting. And the scriptures talks about the exercise of fasting. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, it, it, and it puts a lot of, a lot of value on it. Uh, there's a lot of warnings regarding fastings, but there's also... Uh, but we'll, we'll get into that later. The first kind of fast, just the normal fast, just abstaining from eating. In Matthew 4, 2, it says, when they had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. And when, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he, he was hungry. This is talking about Jesus uh, when he, before he had, uh, was tempted from the, by, the, by Satan. But... From the details given here, the Lord's fast was just a normal fast. He abstained from food, but not from water. Uh, he, ate, he ate nothing, it says in, in Luke 4, 2, it says, but, uh, it didn't, but it didn't say that he drank nothing. So, you know, it says he was hungry. It didn't say that he was thirsty. So this was a normal fast that, that Jesus went through before, we, before the, you know, Satan tempted him to eat, uh, him to eat, but he didn't tempt him not to drink. Uh, we're told that it's a, it's a form of uh, self-denial or abstinence from something <clears throat> is a fast, and it's many things, uh, you know, a lot of people refer to many things as a fast besides food, but, but uh, you know, this is, this is what a typical fast is, is to go without food. And, uh, you know, Jesus and Paul both talked about doing things in, in moderation as far as self-denial. Self-denial can be just a normal everyday practice of not doing things in excess, being moderate in things, but that's not per se a fast. Uh, but scriptures, that we're using today are the ones that are talking about denying oneself of food. Uh, and Paul speaks that uh, his life as an apostle uh, used this continually. In 2 Corinthians 6, 5, he says in stripes, talking about his life as an evangelist, in stripes, imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting. Then in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty seven, he says in weariness and in and toil and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst, in fastings, often and in cold and nakedness. So we see that he was not only hungry, and he fasted both. So Paul practiced, this is something that Paul practiced. Now, 
an absolute fast is is uh, from that's not eating or drinking. When when we were first married, uh, Rose was in the hospital for an extended period, and they never knew what was wrong. And I thought, well, I'm going to fast. And I went three days without food and water, and I thought, I can't do this. And then I found, I was a new Christian, pretty new Christian. And then I found out, well, to fast more than three days without water is almost impossible, because you, you can get by a long time without, uh, without food, uh, but not without water, not without being something miraculous. Uh, you know, Having, to, having water is something that, that, that uh, you, you can't go a long time without. In Ezra 10, 6, it says, Then Ezra rose up from before the house of God and went into the chamber of Jeho Jehonahanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he came there, he ate no bread and drank no water, for he mourned because of the, guilty, the guilt of those from captivity. Uh, you know, his... And it, his, his Strong feelings is what drove him to, to do this and to cause him to fast. In fact, it says in 9.3, it says, so when I heard of this thing, he's talking about Israel's conduct while they were in Babylon, I tore my garments and my robe and plucked out some of my hair and my head and my beard and sat down astonished. In other words, Ezra felt that this was something very serious and it, it, it just... Uh, he was astonished because Israel had had uh, done the deeds that he had mentioned. If you remember Esther, she asked Mordecai to uh, fast for three days, uh, three days without food or water, and uh, it says that her maids did did also. But this was this was a situation where. Uh, the, the Jews were faced with extermination. Uh, so, uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, but anyway, uh, had, there was a plot to exterminate all the Jews out of the kingdom, and uh, it, it, it was a crisis situation. And there's another time mentioned when Saul was struck down on the road to Damascus, and he was literally led by hand to Damascus, and that's when, uh, you know, he was blind and, and, and dazed because and, and, he had just encountered the risen Christ, the one that he'd been fighting against. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was struck blind. In, in Acts 9.9, 9, he says, he was three days without sight and, with, and neither ate nor drank. So... Typically, an absolute fast is usually about three days, because that's that's what the, the body can withstand. Uh, now, Moses fasted on two separate occasions, and it it appears to be consecutive. Uh, not eating or drink for a period of forty days and forty nights. And both of these occasions is found in. Uh, Let's see, uh, Deuteronomy 9.9. I've got one of them here. Uh, hmm. Well, I've got three verses, but only one. Uh, Kings 19.8. Well, that's not right. Well, anyway, it is, uh, it's, it's in Deuteronomy 9.9 and Exodus 34.28. The one is before he received the Ten Commandments, and it was uh, afterwards the children of Israel had made an idol, and Aaron had made an idol, you know, while he threw the gold in the fire and the scab came out. So he told them, well, God told Moses to get down off the mountain because, because of what Israel was doing. But Moses had fasted 40 days and 40 nights without food and without water. So that was when he broke the, the when he when he came upon them and, and he threw the tablets down. They broke. Uh, a lot of symbolism there, but uh, he did it again because Moses went back up and got the commandments the commandments before he 
received them again, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, that was supernatural. That was not the ordinary absolute fast. Uh, the human body could not survive under those extremes. Uh, so Elijah, after he as, as, was escaped from Jezebel when she wanted his life, uh, he was told to eat, drink, and, and it says in 19, Kings 19.8, so he arose and ate, drink, and he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as horror of the Mount of God. So, you know, the absolute fast is for, is an exceptional measure. Uh, typically, especially if you're working while you're doing this, it even makes it even harder. Uh, the physical uh, uh, things that restrict us from, from doing an absolute fast. Uh, so, uh, you know, one needs to be very sure that that's, you know, to consider it carefully before one goes on. There's other ramifications. Uh, but people have literally died trying to do, do this. Uh, I've heard of people who, who have. Uh, and the, the third kind of fast is a partial fast. And we see several examples of that. Uh, Daniel, in, in, uh, in the first chapter of Daniel, says uh, when D Daniel was, they were him and his comrades were given a diet to eat, uh, and he, he refused it uh, or asked to be given pulse. It says, at the end of 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in the flesh than all the young men that ate the portion of the king's delicacy. So, uh, you know, God, God blessed them. There was some supernatural intervention that, that went on there, but, but Daniel had no problem with denying the, the good food that, that was set before him. Uh, in, in a later time here in Daniel chapter 10, it says David, uh, Daniel was seeking understanding of a vision that he'd seen, and he knew the great importance of it. It says in, in chapter two and three, it says, uh, in those days I, Daniel, was mourning full, three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So he, re he restrained himself from pleasant food and no meat or wine. So. Uh, you know, uh, very lim he limited his diet for for three weeks for a purpose, and it resulted in uh, God answering his prayer and giving him understanding, uh, understanding these these uh, visions that he had seen. That uh, when this angelic messenger came and explained it to him, Elijah uh, at Cherith, he had was brought. Uh, bread and meat morning and evening by the ravens, uh, and he drank from the brook. And this was akin to a partial fast. He, he had a limited diet. Uh, John the Baptist says he ate locusts and honey. I'm not sure if that, that simply means that he, he ate a simple diet for, because of his service to God or, or that, but uh, living exclusively on, on on one type of food for a dura duration, or omitting it, uh, omitting perhaps a certain meal. I think that's recognized as a, a, uh, a fast of sorts. <clears throat> now, one thing about fasting, uh, you, can, you can go to extremes. You know, if you fast all day long and eat as much as you can, then you miss the, your even meal. I'm not sure if that's really considered a fast, at least in God's eyes. But also, I think people need to be really careful about fasting because there are some people that, uh, you know, are diabetic or different for different reasons. You know, they 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 have to eat more often. So all these things need to be taken into account. I think the primary thing is to remember what the purpose of it. The purpose of, of it is to basically to, to show God your earnestness 
in, in, uh, in what your request is or what you're fasting for. Uh, the partial fast can be like a stepping stone to someone who's never fasted before to kind of know what they can do or what they can't do. And uh, also in a partial fast, you know, you can, you can resume eating. If you fast 40 days and 40 nights from food, you can't just go out and eat a big meal. I'd probably be pretty drastic. It, it would, you wouldn't, uh, uh, oh, I've heard stories, I don't remember just what the instance was of people who have been in starvation and they've eaten a large amount of food and it's killed them from doing it because of ingesting so much the body about not being able to handle it. But uh, uh, biblical fasting is something that it can be public, calling a solemn fast, and, and it can be something in private, which I think probably the private, just as prayer, because prayer is, uh, serves pretty much the same. Usually, you, very often you see these together uh, because it's approaching God. It's, uh, it's uh, a, perhaps a request or, you know, but, uh, but these are all done, uh, you know, voluntarily. What, uh, you know, what Jesus taught his disciples concerning, concerning fast was uh, should be, we should look at that as, as how we conduct our, our attitude towards fasting. Uh, when he spoke about fasting and pray, praying, uh, you know, Jesus warned them about doing it for, for the wrong purposes, for just making yourself you know, practicing their piety before men as just a show uh, so that we'd be seen by them. Uh, and he didn't, but he didn't say, if you pray, but he said, when you pray. And he also said, if you fast, he didn't, he didn't say if you fast, but when you fast. So obviously, Jesus considered it something that was normal for uh, for his children, for God's children to do, and he practices it himself. Uh, it is something that's perhaps distinct from from praying, in that it is uh, it is a practice of self denial, but uh, it is certainly strongly linked with with. Uh, in fact, in in Acts thirteen that we read earlier, it's. Is something the church did. It was linked with their worship. Uh, but you know, the disciples, uh, uh, the disciples were asked. You know, they asked Jesus why the the, the Pharisees fasted and his disciples didn't. And he told them that. Well, he gave them the analogy of the bridegroom and the and the wedding guests as being a, there was a season of uh, rejoicing, there was a season for mourning. And it seems that these, there's two stages here that it's talking about. <clears throat> In Matthew 19, 15, this first sentence says, uh, and Jesus said to him, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with him? So in other words, the disciples were with the Messiah. You know, they were, they were relishing in in his teaching and in his guidance and, and, uh, and that uh, as long as the bridegroom was with him, you know, during his earthly ministry. And then the second sentence of this, this verse says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast, then they will fast. Uh, and we know that after that Jesus left in the New Testament church, they were incorporated Fasting, you know, in their in their their things, as, as we evidence in the New Testament, of in Acts and and Paul's Paul 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 talked about in, in that. So, uh, you know, it says that uh, in another place, uh, twenty five six of Matthew, it says, and at the midnight cry, I. I at midnight, a cry was heard, behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out and meet him. Well, that midnight cry 
is the return of, of, of the Lord, of, of, of Jesus. And uh, so in the analogy here, what we can take out of this is that while the Lord is not present with us, you know, we can't see the Lord. We don't have him speaking to us verbally what we should do and shouldn't do. But uh, it is the time to fast. The bridegroom is not with us. The bridegroom is coming. You know, it talks in Revelations about uh, one of the trumps when those under the altar cried, how long, O Lord? Well, I think a lot of times in our spiritual walk, in our daily lives, we think when things are so bad, how long, O oh Lord? So, you know, at times we are, we are, uh, we long deeply for the Lord's return, but we know that we, got, we have to stand strong and that would cause us to fast, uh, to seek God's face. Um, because it's, you know, it's through God's spirit that, that he communicates with us or gives us understanding and, and uh, gives us the strength to, to carry through. Uh, you know, this is the age when the, the bridegroom is absent. It is in this age that what the master meant when he said, when Jesus said, then they will fast. You know, the, the time is right now. Uh, and the first Christians fulfilled, fulfilled the words of, that Jesus spoke in this parable. So uh, his, I guess the question is, what do we do today? And I think it should be our custom. And I, I'm not, uh, I feel it's just like prayer. God answers prayer by, by what our attitude is by our selflessness of whatever it is, our, uh, our uh, humility. Uh, you know, so often they would, uh, when someone would fast in the Old Testament, they would, they would tear their, their, their garment, their, their coat, mantle, and fast, and throw on ashes and all those that kinds of things. But uh, it's symbolic of what their attitude was they're humbling themselves uh, before God. And we know he's returning. And, you know, he tells us that we're supposed to prepare. We're supposed to be like the, 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 the virgins that have our lamps trimmed with oil in our lamp. The Holy Spirit has to be present in our lives. Uh, we, we have to continue to cultivate that and, and to walk. Uh, with him and at times sometimes you know we need to do whatever it takes to to uh, entreat our God to to uh, give us help uh, there are times when we think well God's God's not there or he's left us but uh, he wants us to show ourselves uh, earnest serious about, about our walk with God. Uh, fasting is something that God acknowledges and recognizes as a, as a way to communicate with him. And, you know, well, we buy, bide our time here. You know, we're all waiting. We all realize how mortal we really are. But we also realize that he does answer prayer. And, uh, whatever those requests takes to, for, for us. But, uh, you know, when we face trials or, or, or perhaps we, we seek to intercede for others, that's a, that's a good time to do it. Uh, so I'm, I'm, there's a, another half to this message and I'll bring it in a couple weeks. Uh, but when we hear the, that, that wonderful cry, you know, behold the cry who cometh, uh, I don't think we'll have to, we'll fast on that day. I think it'll be a, a time of rejoice, rejoicing, and uh, that will be the feast that's referred to in Jesus' parables as the, the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we all look forward to that. God bless you.